So now before uh, I explain a bit how to do these things in, in practice, uh, I'm going to talk uh, generalize from what we saw in our encoders to uh, representation learning. So the basic idea here is uh, that uh, the features that we have on the data, so the, those key things that uh, structure the data, can be very important for solving problems. For example, uh, using uh, Arabic numerals like we use uh, nowadays makes uh, algebra a lot simpler than using Roman numerals because those are very hard to use for, for addition, subtraction, division and so on. Uh, in machine learning we also have this problem. If you try to solve the classification problem, regression problem, something like that, if you have the right features, the right representation of the data, the problem becomes much easier to solve. And we saw that in deep learning, we have the neural networks learning the appropriate representations until we reach the end and we solve the problem. So the, the basic idea here is that um, we want to learn the best representation of the data. And often with supervised learning, we can have a limited set of data and problems with overfitting because when we are trying to solve problems with supervised learning, not only do we need examples, but we also need the ground truths to label them with the desired results in order to train the network. And that is often expensive. It's very easy to gather images from the internet. It's much harder to add each of them labeled with what the image contains. Uh, so those uh, data uh, will generally be fewer and then we um, have problems with overfeeding and so on. But uh, unsupervised learning, we saw with autoencoders, can help us find good representations, learn the features. So uh, this is the, the general idea that uh, it's a, a big improvement on trying to solve these problems. If in addition to the labeled data that we have, we can also try to learn some useful representation with unlabeled data. So this is, uh, you can uh, read this paper about the representation learning from 2013, but these are some, some bullet points from the paper and uh, um, uh, some assumptions or some things that we can consider about the data that make uh, the idea of finding a good representation something that we expect to be feasible. One thing is that even though the data may have a high dimension, the actual data is not distributed over the whole space uh, of possibilities. So consider, for example, images of, uh, of anything, objects, dogs, cats, uh, landscapes, whatever. If you take a random set of pixel values, you will not get uh, an image of anything. That will be just what the, the old TVs showed when there was no emission or something like that. So the, the space of possible pixel combinations is much, much larger than the space of meaningful images. Even if you consider images of anything, from clouds to mi microscopy to whatever. Uh, so the actual data is distributed in some subspace of the actual dimensions of the, uh, of the, the data that we have. And so if we can find that subspace, we can find more compact, uh, more useful representations of the data. Another aspect is usually uh, data is uh, uh, representing or is uh, being dependent of factors that may be independent uh, among themselves. Uh, for instance, um, a car is still a car regardless of the color of the car. So you have uh, one thing that is a shape that determines that it's a car and then another feature that is a color that is independent uh, from that. Uh, and so uh, we have the, the final result is a combination of these independent facts. And if we can identify them, we have a, a much better representation of the data. Usually these factors also are organized in, in the, uh, hierarchies. You can have uh, elements of pictures that are things like edges and colors and so, things like that, but then you have at a higher level uh, shapes like circles and squares and then at a, a still higher level combinations of these shapes and so on. And uh, and labeled data is generally much more abundant than labeled data. So the idea of using unlabeled data to help us learn the structure of the data before passing on to 
uh, using the label data uh, is promising here. Another uh, uh, useful aspect is that, in general, some uh, aspects that, uh, of the data that are useful to solve one problem can also be useful even if we have a different data set and are solving a different problem. In uh, image processing, this is very often the case because if you consider the, the detection of lower level patterns like edges, contrasts, lines, things like that, those appear in images in general. It doesn't matter what the domain is, if it's optical character recognition or facial recognition or any other thing, the, the basic elements must be there. So if we learn to extract these elements from one data set, we can then apply this feature extraction to uh, different data sets. And this is one of the things that we're going to, to do today using the network that you trained last week and applying it to a different data set. Um, also, these factors tend to be sparse. So consider everything that a car can have and then consider images of the cars. In general, an image of the car does not have everything the car can have. So it, it may show the car stopped or driving or with people inside, with one person, with more, it shows only one side of the car. It doesn't show the engine or uh, lots of different things. So each example that we are presented may contain only some of the features that are relevant. And uh, if we uh, if use, uh, for example, unsupervised uh, uh, unlabeled data, with, uh, which is much more abundant, we may be able to identify better uh, these features. And uh, also there is this assumption that uh, what we are learning to map from uh, input to output is a smooth function in the sense that if the input is very similar, then the output should be similar too. Again, if you imagine, uh, for example, images or voice recognition or something like that, a small change in the pixels or in the tone of voice should not change what the output is. So if we can capture these regularities, and in theory we can capture these even in unlabeled data, as we saw with things like autoencoder, then we can uh, not only improve the, the problem that we have with labeled data being uh, rarer and having fewer examples, but also we can then uh, transfer what we learn in one domain, where we may have many examples, to another domain where we may have fewer examples. So these are uh, uh, the, the assumptions that seem reasonable, that makes us expect uh, that we can transfer this knowledge from one domain to another, and also that we can learn from unlabeled data to identify these uh, features. So one example of applying this is unsupervised pre-training. Um, this was a, an initial approach to training deep neural networks before rectified linear units, good hardware optimizers, and so on. Uh, so one problem was with the vanishing was the, the vanishing gradients problem that uh, made training get stuck when we have too many layers and the gradients uh, fall to zero. So one approach would be to optimize each layer of the network independently, uh, and uh, so this is the, the layer wise. Uh, there in the uh, in the name, um, and the, the idea is that uh, uh, you have the input and you train the first layer as the representation layer of an autoencoder to try to reproduce the same uh, input. And now you transform your input into that representation and use that representation as the input for the the second layer that you're also going to train as a one hidden layer autoencoder. And then you transform again and use that for the third and so on, and you keep stacking these layers. So eventually, these uh, will create uh, representations and representations of representations and so on, which is what the deep neural network is doing. And the idea is that stacking a, a sufficient number of layers and using tricks like the denoising, for example, adding noise to the inputs and trying to recover it, will get us uh, better and better representations so that then when we bring everything together, we have a network that is ready to, to solve our problem. Uh, so this was called pre-training because once you do that, you can then train everything with uh, backpropagation, but now you're already close to the desired solution, hopefully, and so you don't need to do much backpropagation 
and you mitigate the problem with uh, uh, vanishing rates. Now, this is no longer uh, widely used, this approach, because with the rectified linear units and better optimizers, we don't need to do this, we can train the whole network. But the idea can still be uh, adapted to, to some domains. Uh, so, uh, the general reason why this works is that instead of starting our network with uh, random values for the weights, we are starting the network with values that make some sense, at least for creating representations that capture the structure of the data. So this works a bit like a, a regularization, uh, because uh, it, in fact it's a way of changing the training of a network, and uh, it, uh, by creating these useful representations of the inputs, it helps find the right features, or adjust the weight of the network to find at least useful uh, features of the data. Uh, this is especially good when we have uh, initial representations that are very uh, uninformative or difficult to deal with. For example, in natural language processing, we need to convert uh, text into something that we can use in our model. So we cannot put the words in our models, we need vectors. So usually uh, we have this one hot encoding where we have, for example, a list of 10,000 possible words and each word that occurs in our text is a vector of uh, 9,999 zeros and the one corresponding to that particular word. So we have one of these vectors for the first word, another for the second, and now we can convert any text into a matrix of different vectors representing all the words. The problem is that all of these vectors have one value at 1 and the rest at 0, and they are all equidistant from each other unless the words are equal, because they are just unit vectors pointing in different directions in this 10,000 dimension space. And that makes it very hard to compare words and to uh, how meaningful are is that those two words come one after the other or something like that. So unsupervised free training can uh, uh, help us uh, create good embeddings of this and, and uh, uh, models that use this. Nowadays, by the way, this is uh, unsupervised is going a bit out of fashion and for these cases the, the fashionable term nowadays is self-supervised. But the, the idea is basically the same. But you have models for, for processing natural language where um, you are training uh, embeddings, training representations, starting from these huge vectors and training the network to create compact representations by doing things like uh, picking phrases at random from textbooks and, and the internet and so on, hiding some words, and then you present the net to the network and the network has to reconstruct the original with the words, the right words in place. So the network starts to learn from which words come together. So if uh, uh, the, the text is the lion hunts uh, something in the savanna, so the network will probably not put a dolphin, but put a, a gazelle or an antelope or something like that. So uh, the, it's going to learn these correlations between the words and create uh, useful representations for that. This is one uh, case where pre-training, unsupervised pre-training or self-supervised pre-training is very used in natural language uh, processing. There are other uh, cases, but in general when we have these uh, uh, poor representations, for example, um, this paper on uh, human actions, this data set, each vector has uh, 5,000 uh, values and then only a few ones depending on the kind of movement uh, is being detected on the sensors and the, the, uh, the humans are doing. But using uh, the denoising autoencoder uh, and then creating a, a, a three-dimensional representation of the, the hidden layer, uh, you can see that different actions are uh, spread in different uh, uh, places of this space. So this is uh, just the, the name of the, of the paper if you want to take a look. But the idea here is that when you have your initial data in some representation that is not very good, then this uh, supervised pre-training can help find the structure in the data before we proceed to uh, supervised learning. Uh, if uh, uh, label data is scarce, then we can also take advantage of these uh, 
pre-training as a form of regularization to prevent overfitting. So this is a, a, an example in this paper. The authors trained the same network uh, several times uh, uh, and plotted the trajectories using these uh, uh, TSNE and ISOMAP methods. Uh, so remember that uh, each net the network has millions of, of parameters. So if we want to see the trajectory, how the parameters change during training, we have to reduce uh, greatly the dimensionality. So the idea is using these, these methods they could uh, uh, show that uh, with pre-training, the networks are being spread out in a different uh, space of the, the parameter space than without pre-training. So uh, without pre-training, they start at random and then they start training the network on the, uh, the labeled data. With pre-training, it's first pre-trained on unlabeled data and then uses that starting point. So it's actually different regions in, uh, this is uh, with TSNE, representation TSNE favors keeping the topology of close neighbors, but ignores mostly the distance between distant neighbors, because since they will not be chosen as, na as neighbors, they, they don't matter. ISOMAP, uh, if you recall, takes the distances in the graph of nearest neighbors. So even uh, points that are very far apart, will still need to be far apart in the projection because the path is longer there. So here we can see that with pre-training, the, the weights of the networks, of the different networks that were being trained, are all uh, in this region here and they uh, are all together. So it seems that pre-training grouped them all into one region of the uh, space of possible parameter values. And without pre-training, it's a lot more spread out. So we can see pre-training has having this regularization effect that it's going to constrain the networks to some uh, smaller regions of the parameter space. <clears throat> so this is uh, historically important because it was the first way of, of uh, training deep neural networks before uh, 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 rectified linear units and the kind of hardware that we have now. Uh, it has some disadvantages because if you have two training stages, it complicates things a bit, like the, the, the adjustment of meta parameters, selecting the right model, things like that, gets more complicated because what works well at one stage may not work well uh, on the other. Uh, but it's still used in some applications, especially when the original representations are very messy and we have um, uh, much more unlabeled data than we have labeled data. So in natural language processing, for example, this kind of self-supervised or unsupervised pre-training is very used. Uh, another thing that we can do with uh, the representations that networks learn is to transfer the, uh, the, transform uh, the transformations the network learns to do in one domain and transfer that to a different domain. Uh, this can work because uh, usually in the different domains there may be shared features. For example, in image processing, the kinds of, of uh, uh, elements of the image that are useful in one problem may also be useful in another. Uh, and also because there are some uh, higher level structure in the data that has to be shared. For example, in speech recognition, even though the voice of the person, one person to another, may be different in detail. The structure of the language is the same, if they are speaking the same language, the kind of words, and so on. So there are elements, there are some correlations that are found in the data that would still apply if you go from one person to another, and so you can transfer knowledge of a network trained with one particular voice to another voice, or eventually trained in one language to another language, because languages, human languages also have many similarities, some languages are a lot more similar than, the, than others, and so on. Uh, and also, we may have uh, actually a very similar mapping, even though the domain is, is different. For example, uh, sentiment analysis is one uh, area of application of machine learning that is uh, uh, widely used nowadays, which is basically trying to figure out from text somebody wrote, uh, how the person is feeling, if it's positive or negative, if they are angry or happy. And this is important if you have, for instance, uh, some commercial site where people write comments and you may want to have some quick statistics 
of how the people are feeling without having to read all the comments yourself because that may actually be very unpleasant, not only uh, laborious. So these kinds of models are used to try to automate the inference of the sentiment of, of, for the people. Suppose that you have one model trained on a, a database where people wrote reviews of movies or songs, things like that, and now you want to solve the same problem in an electronic store uh, to check the comments that people leave on your site, even though the domain is different because the kind of words people use when they are talking about the movie will not be the same as when they are talking about the TV they bought or something like that. There is some underlying structure in the same kind of differences between an angry comment or a positive comment. And so you may uh, use uh, transfer learning or even unsupervised free training uh, with the data from one domain to help uh, with the other and so forth. Uh, another thing that can occur is this concept drift, where the domain is the characteristics of the data are changing uh, gradually over time. Either because the mapping we have from features to what we're trying to predict is becoming different. Uh, for instance, changes in economy, uh, in how the economy is going, may lead to changes in the mapping from features like the, uh, the salary the person has the cars they bought and things like that, and whether or not they are uh, at risk of defaulting on the credit they are asking for. So it depends on how the economy is going, and uh, this can be changing over time, and the, the, the uh, system may have to learn a different mapping or a slightly different mapping as time goes on. Or the actual distribution of the data uh, can uh, vary. For instance, suppose that you have uh, a business online that is very specific, so you're selling some kind of electronic equipment or something like that, but then it becomes very famous, lots of people start coming, and the profile of the, of the clients for that site will start to change from those that were very specialized to now a more general population. And so the data distribution starts to change, but these are gradual processes. So here, um, we may not need to retrain everything from scratch uh, uh, when we, we notice that the, the model starts to perform uh, uh, worse, but we may start from what we had previously and just keep training a bit more from that with, with new examples. So in this case we are using what we learned before because things are slightly different but not that much different. Uh, so basically the idea here in transfer learning is to use um, the previous experience in new circumstances. Yeah. So what do we change if we see that our training did not go well and we want to train again? No, suppose in this example that you had a good model that that managed to predict, for example, the, the, the risk of, of defaulting on, on loans or something like that, but now it starts to perform uh, uh, the, the performance is, is decreasing because it starts to make more and more mistakes. So instead of just taking all the data and retraining everything from scratch, you can start with the, the parameters that you already have and train for a few more efforts with the, with the new data, okay. just to adjust. So as, as if what you learned before was the pre-training and now you keep... Uh, so the difference is just the data that we are using? In this case, if the, if the data changes or the, the mapping changes, you can, you can uh, do that, yes. Uh, or you, if you have some change in the domain, for example, now uh, you have a different problem, which is, uh, um, I don't know, with credit, maybe you have other things you want to predict if the person is going to move from your bank to another one or something like that. So this is not the same as predicting uh, if they are going to default on credit, but maybe there are some common things in the, the attribute, so you could use part of the feature extraction uh, layers of the network and then try to learn from that. So that would not be concept drift, that would really be transfer learning, which is this is what we learned so far, we're going to apply here and then we're going to add uh, just something, new layers, something like that. Uh, so the, the idea here is that we don't have to start from scratch, we can learn from different domains or different circumstances and then uh, take advantage of that in uh, new circumstances. 
And this can lead to these extreme examples like one-shot learning or zero-shot learning where uh, when you uh, use what you learned uh, previously, you can apply that to a new, a completely new uh, circumstance uh, just by taking advantage of the structure of the data. So this is one example of zero-shot learning where uh, there were basically uh, two models for uh, uh, learning the manifold of words like truck, auto, horse, and things like that. Uh, and also uh, another one that mapped from a set of known images to the manifold of words. So that if we have an image of a horse, it maps to the representation of the horse word in this manifold and uh, the cat, uh, uh, the dog, and so on. Uh, if we have a new test image from some class that was not present in, the, in this mapping, it can still lead, uh, when you use the same network, it's, it can still lead to the right place in the manifold. It's just pointing to a new word that corresponds uh, to, to the, the new class that we're getting here. So this is an example of zero-shot learning because now we are classifying images in classes that we never used before, just because we can map the image to the right words that uh, classify the image. Um, so this is an example of joining, combining uh, learning from different domains. So basically, uh, the advantage here is that we can uh, use uh, what we learned in other domains, and you can uh, do this easily in CADAS because there are um, uh, lots of uh, networks that have been trained, for example, on the image map data set that contains about 1.2 million images. These networks are very big, hard to train, they can take weeks to, to train. But now you have the networks and the weights online, so you can download them and use those networks if you want. Um, and this, uh, you can then use uh, this either uh, completely, downloading the, the network and using them, for example, to classify uh, images according to the classes the network were trained for, but you can use just uh, part of the network, for example, the feature extraction, and train new layers for a particular problem you're trying to solve. For example, suppose that you want the network to organize your images into vacations and work and home or things like that. You have some examples, but not enough to extract all the features. You use the first part, the uh, or most of these networks to extract the right features and then just train a small classifier on top of that. Uh, so because you have you are training a simpler model just for that particular task, you don't need as much data and all the complicated part was already learned before on the larger data set. So let's see an example of that, uh, how to do that in practice. You, you uh, last week trained a network to classify the fashion NIST training set where we have these small 28 by 28 images of different kinds of clothes, template, different types, and uh, the network was trained to classify these. So basically you have lots of convolution layers where you extract the right features and then you have a, a dense part of the network that does the, the classification. So now what we're going to do is use the same uh, model the part that extracts features with all the convolution layers that has learned to extract features from the clothes. And we're going to retrain or to train a new uh, classifier at the end of this network in order to use the features that are being extracted from the other dataset to classify the least dataset, which is this uh, of handwritten digits. Um, and we're going to use the Keras functional API because that sequential API where if we just add layers doesn't have the flexibility uh, to do this. So you're going to create the same graph as the model you had uh, last week, only you're going to use this uh, uh, functional API, but you're going to create exactly the same model so that you can load the weights that you saved last week. Last week after training, I recommended that you save the, the weights, so now you can load them and you have the same network trained uh, that you had last, last week. We're going to freeze the weights of the convolutional part, so we're going to tell carriers not to adjust those, although the, the most part of the network will just be frozen, and we're only going to train a new classifier end on the network, 
with the NIST dataset, but now using the features, ex all this feature extraction network that learned uh, ex to extract features from the fashion NIST. So, what you're going to do is first, uh, you're going to need the, the NIST dataset, but this is very similar to the fashion NIST, it's part of Keras. The first time you run this, it will download the, the data, but from then on, you will have it in cache. And you're going to do the same thing that you did before. So we have the train and the test data, and we're going to reshape this, because this is in a, a two-dimensional matrix. We're going to reshape this in the 28 by 28 by 1 uh, for the convolutions, and uh, uh, convert from bytes, which go from 0 to 255, into this uh, 0 to 1 closing point. So if you did this uh, normalization last week, do it again now. If you forgot to do it last week, don't do it again now, because we need the images to be on the same scale again, because you're going to use the first part of your network exactly as it was trained last week. So the images must be in the same scale. Uh, all, another thing, you're, we are not going to use the, the sequential API, we are going to use the functional, so we need this class model to uh, group the layers into a model. But now, the way we're going to do with the functional uh, API to create a model is instead of creating that sequential model and then using the add method to add new layers, we're going to chain together layers by using them as functions. So all of these uh, objects, uh, input, convolution, activation, and so on, can be used as functions where we have uh, an argument. Uh, and usually in the functional API, we start with this special layer, which is the input, that is just basically a placeholder for the data that we're going to uh, input into the network. So you need to import this uh, input uh, layer, and we're going to start our network by uh, the same way we did uh, before, the input with this shape, 28 by 28 by 1, and we are going to give this one a name so that in the model we can uh, identify it by name if we need. And now what we're going to do is chain these together by using the, the class for the layer, giving whatever parameters we need, and using it as a function of the previous layer. The reason why this is uh, more flexible than the, the sequential method is that this allows you to build any graph that you want. Because you can put things that are branching or that are being uh, concatenated together and things like that. And you are not limited to just creating a network that is a, a, a sequence of layers from beginning to end. So what we're going to do here is uh, reproduce exactly the same model as we had last week. So look at your code, but just do it on the functional uh, API by adding each layer uh, as chained to the previous layer. Now here, uh, I'm using something that may seem uh, confusing at, uh, at first, because I'm always using the same variable name here, but it's not a problem because we don't need uh, to have a name pointing to each of these individual layers. All we need is to chain them together. So I have these inputs, I use the convolution 2D on the inputs, and I store a pointer to this convolution 2D, and now I feed this one into the next one, and I store a pointer to the new one, so I'm always pointing layer to the last one, and chaining it all together as if I was building a necklace or something like that. Okay? Um, so all of the layers that we don't really care about, we can just uh, do it like this, and then eventually we can have a, a special layer here that I can uh, keep on a, a different variable, which is this feed that I call the features layer, which is the flatten, the output of the, of the flatten after all the convolutions that you had. So remember that you built a classifier by putting all of those convolutions and pooling layers, and then you flatten everything into a single vector to go into the dense part of the network. We want to separate this because we are going to use the weights from last week on this first part, but then we're going to branch from here into a new classification network to train for NIST. But we first continue uh, writing all the, the models so that we have everything that we had from last week. And now we create a model 
that is going from the inputs uh, layer here, this variable that I created here, and it's going all the way to this layer variable, which is at the output of the, the softmax. So this model uh, class is going to create, uh, to look at that chain of layers and create a model based on that chain. Now I can compile the model, load the weights, and I'm going to loop through all the layers in this old model and uh, make trainable false. This is something that you can do in cache. When you call fit, if a layer has trainable false, it will not be changed. The parameters are not adjusted. So this, will, uh, this network will be frozen. And now what we're going to do is to create a dense layer for classification that starts from the output tensor of the layer on the old model called features. This is one way of accessing that layer because I gave the name features. Another possibility would be simply to use uh, the features variable if you want. But this is just to show you how you can do things. So basically what we're doing now is this is part of the old model and is frozen, but now we're creating a new uh, uh, chain here with uh, dense layer activation, breadth normalization. So this is the same architecture as we used last week, but now this is a new network. It's going to have random weights and we're going to create a model that is going to start from the inputs of the old model. So this part here, where we feed in the image, it's going to go through all the, the convolution parts of the old model, but they are frozen, they will not be trained. And it's going to branch out here, where we created the new model, so here on the features, which is after flattening. So it's going to branch here, and uh, this part is not frozen. So this is the part that is going to be trained. And now we create a new model uh, that has this uh, branching here and we fit it, so we create the, the batch size, the, the optimizer and so on, all of the things that you did last week, and you just call fit. So in this case, what's happening is that uh, all the parts that correspond to the convolution are non-trainable, they are frozen, it's just a dense network at the end that is going to be retrained. And the, the, the first part that you had trained from last week is going to extract in the MNIST dataset, in the handwritten digits, the same kind of features it was looking for in the fashion images. So we are transferring what we learned in one domain to another domain. Okay, so this is the first exercise. You have most of the code here. Just remember that in order for uh, this um, load weights to work, you need to recreate exactly the same model that you had uh, last week when you saved the weights. So look at your code and do the same model, only you're going to do it in the, the, the functional uh, API. Another thing that we're going to do today is to use an autoencoder, a convolutional autoencoder, with the dense part in the middle to reduce the dimensionality of the MNIST dataset, which is this set of images, 28 by 28, but we're going to represent each image with only two values, two coordinates. And that will allow us to plot the different uh, images in a, a two-dimensional plot. And we can see here, this is where the zero appears, uh, one and then two, around here, three. So some of them have some overlap, but for example, the ones are very easy to distinguish from the rest in this representation. Uh, so this will be to uh, implement an autoencoder and then use the encoder part to produce this encoding. So we're going to use the, uh, the uh, API, the functional API again. You're going to need uh, the app sampling uh, to do the decoding. So the, the first part, the encoder, is going to use pooling to get smaller and smaller representations. But then you need to reconstruct the image, so you're going to use app sampling and automate with, uh, with convolution. Uh, we're going to also to need uh, reshape because uh, we're going to do this first part of the encoder is very similar to the classifier that you wrote. So we have convolution layers, uh, pooling, convolution layers, pooling, and so on. And then 
we need to flatten everything to put into this uh, middle layer on the autoencoder where we are only going to have two neurons to generate these coordinates here. And we can leave these without activation. So they will be linear, they can go wherever, whatever they want uh, in, uh, in the values. But after we do this, we have the output of these uh, neurons. We're going to need to create something that has the right number of values to go back up the convolutions again and reshape that into the shape of a, a, a tensor with those filters that the convolutions are using. So uh, we have uh, an initial 28 by 28 image. If you do one pooling, you get to 14 by 14. And then if you do another pooling, it's 7 by 7. So here somewhere I did two poolings. So when I reach here, I have an image that is 7 by 7. And it was actually eight filters that I had in the last uh, layer here. So this is set a feature map that is 7 by 7 and has eight uh, maps stacked together because I used eight filters on this last convolution layer. So now, to go back, I need to produce a tensor that is 7 by 7 in uh, width and height, and then 8 in depth, and I have to produce that from these two values to start uh, going back up the decoder. So I'm going to uh, create a dense layer with 8 times 7 times 7 neurons that are, is going to get input from these two neurons here, and produce this tensor that I'm going to reshape into a 7x7 seven seven with 8 uh, of depth, which is what matches the, the convolution that came here. Now, when you do this, you may either uh, compile the model here and see what are the sizes of the tensors, because when you do the summary, it can tell you, or you just do the calculations with the, uh, with the, the, the pooling and take care, for example, of using padding same on the convolutions because that means after the convolution is applied the feature map has the same size as what entered the convolution if you don't do that the convolution will be the, the feature map will be slightly smaller because the convolution cannot go all the way to the end of the matrix uh, without padding and so that will complicate the, the, the calculations but you can either try to do that by hand or compile part of the model and see the summary to see what are the sizes. But what we need to do now is to do the same thing in reverse so that we have two equivalent parts in the autoencoder and we don't have some unbalance in those uh, uh, parts that will lead to some distortions in the representation. Uh, so now we uh, create this dense layer here, we reshape it and we feed it into uh, uh, the convolutional layer that is equivalent to this one here. And now we go back doing uh, all the convolutions in reverse order. And uh, uh, instead of uh, uh, pooling, we do the assembling with the same size and do all the convolutions. So now we go back in reverse order doing convolutions and assembling until we reach the end. When we reach the end, we have to generate something that is the equivalent of the input that we have here. So one easy way of doing that is to create a convolution with one single filter and then put a sigmoid activation there because uh, we normalize our images, so images uh, have pixel values between 0 and 1. If we end with a convolution with one single uh, uh, feature, with one single filter, for a grayscale image, this will be the equivalent, and the sigmoid activation means that all pixels will be between 0 and 1, so we don't need to do some uh, post-processing or something like that to convert that into an image. Okay, so now we have the model. Uh, the autoencoder is a model that goes from the inputs here all the way to this last layer where we produce the, the image with the sigmoid activation. But the encoder is a model that goes from the input to this uh, features layer that I called here, which is the dense layer with the two neurons that produce the, uh, the coordinates. So in this way, we can immediately create the two models that we need. The autoencoder for training, where we feed the same image in and out to train all the, the weights. 
and then the encoder for converting the images into that two-dimensional representation. Okay, so the, the architecture I suggest is to start with 32 filters, pooling, then 32 filters, convolution, 16 filters, and pooling, and so on. So you can use this, or you can experiment with different uh, uh, um, architectures. But the idea is that the, the encoding will gradually reduce the amount of data that we have, or the size of the tensors. So remember that when you do pooling, you are reducing the size of the tensor by four times because you're halving on the height and halving on the width. And uh, uh, in that case, for example here, if I have 32 filters and then pooling, I'm reducing it four times, so I keep 32 filters here. Because if I also reduce to 16 filters, this would be a reduction of eight times, eightfold reduction on the day. But then, from this convolution to this one, if I don't, uh, 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 from this one to this one, for example, if I don't have pooling from this 32 to 16, I can reduce the number of filters, and then I do pooling and keep the number of filters, or you can double the number of filters, because if you do pooling, you're reducing by four. If you double the number of filters, then you're only reducing by two, and you can adjust that. But the, the idea is that you do a gradual reduction in size until you reach here, uh, the, the middle where you have only the, uh, so this one, the dense layer with two neurons. This will be the representation that we want. Note that we are only using two neurons because we want to plot this in two dimensions. In general, the two, two, uh, a size two representation for such a large input would be a very drastic reduction and may make you lose a lot of information. So in general, if you're using this, for example, to extract features or classification or something like that, you should not be so drastic in the reduction unless there is a good reason for that. But in this case, we went for visualization, so reduced to two. And now we do the convolutions in reverse and use up sampling instead of pooling. Just build the symmetrical of the encoder. Um, one important thing here about training auto encoders that is um, um, makes this in practice a bit harder to use, is that uh, when you're training a, a classifier, you have a, a large reduction in the error function at the beginning, and then things stabilize, and when they stabilize and you have only a tiny reduction in the loss function, there is no real benefit in continuing training because it will not affect much the performance of the classifier. However, in the autoencoder, what you want is not so much uh, the, the overall loss function, but to get a good representation at the, the, the center. And the details of the, the reconstruction will weigh very little on the loss function. So if you, can, if you can manage to make a blob that is more or less like the 8, you get a huge reduction in the loss function with, com in comparison to, say, making a white square or something like that. But getting the exact details of the pixels only affects a small part of the loss function. But that can be important to get a good representation here. So with the uh, autoencoders, training usually takes some time and you need to be patient to, to try to squeeze out as much as possible of the loss function to get a good representation there. And, and remember to save the weights after training so you don't have to repeat training when looking at, at the results. Uh, so, now how can we create this representation here? This is a sample of the code for that. Uh, we call this autoencoder function, uh, the one that I created here, and get the two models, uh, the autoencoder and the encoder alone. We train the autoencoder and we save the weights here to this file. So now we can load the weights for the whole autoencoder. But this also includes the encoder, because the encoder is part of the autoencoder. So now we can use the encoder part with the weights that we loaded to uh, run all the, the images in our test set. So uh, uh, I trained when you use the MNIST data set, you get, um, I had the example here, you get the training and the test set. So this is 50,000 images for training and 10,000 for test. We are not going to use a, a test set, we don't we care much about the error itself, but uh, just to show this problem of uh, 
extrapolating from training data to test data, I uh, plotted the, uh, the test images, not the training images. So if you have overfitting on your autoencoder, this will work well for the training images, but not very well outside the training images. So what we do here is to we use predict on the encoder model, and predict will run the, the model and give us the output of that model. And the output of the encoder is this, um, this layer here, which I call features, which is the output of the, these two neurons. So the encoder gives us, in the predict, the two-dimensional representation of the, uh, the images. And now I can create a, a, a plot and uh, loop through all the classes. So this is the test Y is the, uh, the values of the classes 0, 1, 2, and so on. Uh, and I can loop through all these and I can uh, create a mask by selecting the images that belong to that class and then plotting those images, uh, the position of the encoding of those images in the graph. The reason for this loop is to make these different colors for the different classes. You could just plot everything in one go, but then you would have everything in the same color. But this loop makes uh, zero have this blue color, one have this orange, and so on, and automatically changes the colors uh, in the different loops. Another thing that you can uh, look at is how the, well the images were reconstructed. So again, we uh, create the autoencoder, load the weights, and uh, predict the result of the autoencoder, for example, for the first 10 images in the test set. So here we have the reconstruction of these 10 images. And now we can save the original and the restored images to a file where you can then look at with an image editor or something like that. So this is an example. These are original images. These are the images reconstructed by the autoencoder. And again, here, this. So one thing that we can see is, for example, this 4 and this 9 were reconstructed as very similar images. Our autoencoder has a hard time distinguishing between 4 and 9. Uh, probably I didn't train it enough. But, for example, 1s are very easy for the, the autoencoder. And you can see the result of that in the distribution. For example, 1 is here, far away from everything else. But then uh, this, uh, for example, nine is this uh, here, and four is this purple that is here mixed behind uh, the nine. So you see that the autoencoder is not putting four and nine in different places. However, maybe if I try training it a bit more or fiddle the, uh, uh, a bit with the autoencoder to improve it, if it managed to distinguish this, then the representation could be better uh, in the hidden layer in that uh, latent space. But note that this is already a small fraction of the loss function. You can have pretty low loss function and very slow convergence now, but the autoencoder is still learning useful things about the data. So training autoencoders it takes a bit more patience usually because uh, even though the loss function is low, you probably may need to continue training. Okay, so for the first assignment, you're going to do what we've been doing in the exercises uh, so far. Uh, this uh, I'm using real data from, from a, a project I've been working on for some years, and this is super resolution fluorescence uh, microscopy images. And you have uh, the images have been segmented, so these are large photographs with lots of cells. There is a, a software to automatically identify the cells and, and uh, uh, isolate them. So each image is a 40 by 40 pixels image with the cell centered and black all around, zero all around. And you have 400 images that have been labeled by the biologists. So this takes some work, but they have labeled in stage zero, one, and two of the cell cycle. Stage zero is before division starts, so the, the cells uh, are like this. Stage one, the, the septum starts to form, so you can have uh, more fluorescence here because the fluorescence here is on the membrane and when the septum starts to form you have a larger fluorescence there on the, the, that waistband of the, the, the cell. So this is stage one and stage two is when the, the septum is formed 
and the cell is about to, to divide, but before the cell divides. Now, there are some problems that the, the overall brightness changes a lot from cell to cell, the orientation of the septum is different, and so on. And also, we only have 400 labeled images. We have uh, 3,892 3, unlabeled images, so they are similar to this one, but we don't have the classes for those. Uh, you have a zip file with the, with these data and some auxiliary functions and so on. And the way you can use it is you use n uh, the NumPy load methods on this uh, NPD file. And it's a dictionary with the three arrays uh, with the data. This one called unlabeled has uh, all the, the images stacked in the same format that we were uh, using here for uh, after this reshaping. So you, you don't need to do this uh, reshape thing. They are already as 40 by 40 uh, in, the, in size. And uh, uh, and then you also need to convert the uh, labels to uh, categorical. So remember, these labels are 0, 1 or 2 for each of the labeled images. But if you're doing, going to do a multi-class classification, you need to have three neurons as the output for the three classes and the softmax. So you need to encode this with one hot encoding, 001, 010, something like that. And this is what uh, Kerish does here, just like you did with the fashion list and list where you convert the integers into the one hot encoding vector. Okay, so this uh, I give you uh, as part of the code, already the normalization there. This is the set of 400 labeled images. This is the set of 400 labels. And this is the set of 3,800 and something unlabeled images. Now, what you need to do is experiment with these approaches. So first, build a classifier like you did for fashion NIST that uses the 400 labeled images to try to predict the class. Of course, we need to check for overfitting, so I suggest you use 300 for training and 100 for validation. And uh, what we can reasonably expect here is that uh, 400 images is very, a very small set of examples to train a deep neural network for classification because it has millions of parameters. So I'm get too excited. <laughs> And uh, uh, so this will probably lead to a problem with the overfit. Uh, and what we can try to do to solve this is to use this unsupervised learning where we use the unlabeled images to train an autoencoder and then we use the features from the autoencoder, this smaller representation that the autoencoder finds, to try to see if we can create a, a simpler classifier that is just a dense network, small dense network, that takes the data from the, the representation from the autoencoder. So basically, you can use the unlabeled images to train the autoencoder. If you want to check for overfitting, you can use the 400 uh, labeled ones for validation. But after you have the autoencoder, you can create the representations of uh, these 400 images in the autoencoder. These will be shorter vectors than the 1,600 uh, pixel values that you have for each image. And now you can train a very small uh, network, something that is just a dense network, similar to what you did on the first week, with just uh, dense layers and so on. So this is similar to the exercises we've been doing so far, including today. It should not be much uh, uh, work. There may be some... Uh, the autoencoder can take some time to train, and if you don't have a good enough computer or don't want to wait, uh, wait too much, the results will probably not be very good. In any case, do not expect very good results because uh, I'm using real data and doesn't work as well as those type problems with NIST and also we don't have much data because if you have a very large data size then you also need lots of run memory. So this is adjusted to what I think you can easily do in the, the laptop. And also, you're not going to train the autoencoder for a whole day because you fry your laptop. So things will not, the results themselves will not be very impressive. But the main idea here is that you understand what is the purpose of the different steps, what you're uh, uh, testing. 
you interpret the results and you explain uh, these things. So the deadline is ideally next Sunday, so that when you start on the logic part on Monday, you already are done with the, uh, this part. But if you see that it's not possible because of other things and you want to, for example, submit all the assignments at the end of this block, something like that, it's okay. For, for my part, I'm, I don't have a problem, so I suggest that you talk among yourselves and let me know. This is like what we did last semester. The first assignment is not really a problem for the deadline, so um, just choose in a way that is more practical for you. Uh, but uh, note that uh, after uh, May, the beginning of May, you're going to start with a new course on this slot. So it's not a good idea if you still have things to do on this one when you start the second one, that, that can be a bit problematic. So um, this would be, I think, the ideal solution. Get rid of this part before starting the next one. If you need a few more days, let me know, but let's not extend too much this, okay? So uh, this is, you have the, the uh, data there, and you also have one uh, file which is called tp1.txt that has some questions that you need to answer about this part. That is very important because this is not, not about the results that you have, it's partially about your implementation and the ability to get this to work, but it's also about how you understand uh, these things and, uh, and how you can explain what you're doing. So uh, do not leave that part just to do in a rush at the end because that will be a, a big part of the grade how well you explain what you're doing. So to sum up, we saw this uh, idea of using what we learn in one, uh, one set of conditions and supervised or in different domains or something like that and take advantage of that uh, in another set of conditions. So this uh, learning the good representations, transferring that learning for uh, other domains, using that as regularization to guide the training of the network in, for example, supervised learning, things like that. Uh, and uh, even though some of these parts are not no longer used, like the, the greedy layer-wise pre-training, the general idea of using uh, uh, what we learn in one case is to help with others is important, and it's still widely applied in, in many fields. So there are some uh, suggestions of reading these chapters here, and also this uh, uh, paper, which you can find online if you want to take a look, and uh, we can move on to questions.